international order that we have worked for generations to build. Ordinary men and women are too small-minded to govern their own affairs. That order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. Was pulling, and they made that decision to pull curtains that we watched the building collapse. New, 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 a, a new world order. A new world order can emerge. New, 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 a new world order. Some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. This picture tells how the mass migration was accomplished. Evacuation. More than 100,000 men, women, and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast states, 
to wartime communities established in out-of-the-way places. Their evacuation did not imply individual disloyalty, but was ordered to reduce a military hazard at a time when danger of invasion was great. Two-thirds of the evacuees are American citizens by right of birth. The rest are their Japanese-born parents and grandparents. They are not under suspicion. They are not prisoners. They are not internees. They are merely dislocated people, the unwounded casualties of war. The relocation centers are supervised by the War Relocation Authority, which assumed responsibility for the people after they had been evacuated and cared for temporarily by the Army. A relocation center, housing from 7 to 18,000 people, the entire community bounded by a wire fence and guarded by military police, symbols of the military nature of the evacuation. Each family, upon arrival at a relocation center, was assigned to a single room compartment, about 20 by 25 feet. Barren, unattractive. A stove, a light bulb, cots, mattresses, and blankets. Those were the things provided by the government. In 1942, the United States government forcibly relocated over 112,000 Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans to remote housing facilities called war relocation camps for the purpose of detainment, re-education, and forced labor. Of those interned, 62% were United States citizens. President Franklin Roosevelt authorized the internment with Executive Order 9066, allowing military commanders to designate military areas as exclusion zones. This power was then used to declare the entire Pacific coast as an exclusion zone, forbidding people of Japanese descent to live within these areas, unless, of course, they were held in war relocation camps. In 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of these exclusion zones, and in 1945, after two and a half long years of imprisonment, the interns were finally released. The United States government issued no formal apologies but did present each former inmate with exactly $25 in cash and a train ticket home, if they were lucky enough to still have one. Forty-three years later, in 1988, President Ronald Reagan would sign a bill that formally apologized for the internment of Japanese Americans on behalf of the United States government, and finally granted reparations to survivors. The language of the bill stated that government actions of the 1940s internments were based upon three criteria, racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here, we admit a wrong. Here, we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. In 2001, Following the attacks of September the 11th, our government again went into open roundup mode, detaining and imprisoning thousands of United States citizens, again seemingly based upon the same three criteria used to intern Japanese Americans, race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Let there be no argument. The United States government has put its own citizens in detention centers. The justifications for doing so range from personal prejudices based upon political and religious grounds to wartime frenzies and fears of future terrorist attacks. In a time of great crisis, the impossible becomes possible. Is it possible that internment camps are being built in the United States today? Is it possible that history will repeat itself? indefinitely with no charges against them no conviction no sentence just imprisonment
Well, we used internment camps here in the United States during World War II, uh, and we interned Japanese Americans, uh, or Americans, I should say, to be more correct, uh, Americans of Japanese descent. And these people were cordoned off for the duration of the war. Uh, background checks could have been done, they could have been released or cleared out of those facilities, uh, but it was thought best because there was so much animosity toward the Japanese for the attack on Pearl Harbor and subsequent deaths of U.S. soldiers that these people just be kept uh, uh, out of sight in one of their detention facilities. On April 1st, 1979, by Presidential Executive Order 12127, the Federal Emergency Management Agency was created for the purpose of coordinating the response to disasters that have occurred in the United States and that overwhelm the resources of local and state authorities. Upon its creation, FEMA absorbed the Federal Insurance Administration, the National Fire Prevention and Control Administration, the National Weather Service Community Preparedness Program, as well as several other federal level preparedness programs. FEMA was also given the responsibility for overseeing the United States Civil Defense, a function which had previously been performed by the DOD's Defense Civil Preparedness Agency. In 2003, FEMA became part of the Department of Homeland Security's Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate. FEMA follows three simple directives. One, national emergency recovery, two, continuity of government, and three, combating perceived threats to the existing social and political order. FEMA's implicit objective to provide aid to victims of disasters changed under the leadership of President George W. Bush. Although some may argue, prior to the Bush administration, FEMA's reaction time for responding to and the handling of national emergencies was beginning to improve. But in 2003, President Bush would shift the focus of responding to emergencies in America by placing FEMA under the umbrella of the Department of Homeland Security, whose stated objective was and still is to protect our nation do you believe the President of the United States should have the power to indefinitely detain people captured within the U.S. without the normal due process of law? I don't. And honestly, I don't think most Americans do. And I don't think most members of Congress do. We've gotten bogged down in different little sub-pieces of the debate in U.S. citizens and who counts and who doesn't count. But the fundamental question is, do you believe that the President should have the power to indefinitely detain people captured in the U.S. without normal due process of law. If you don't, if you are concerned about that executive power, then the only way to take that out of our law is to vote for Smith-Gibson. The rest of this just sort of moves it around on the edges, but very clearly leaves that power with the president, a power I don't think that he should have. There's no incentive for U.S. terrorists to come here. Um, they are trying to attack us, but we capture them successfully, try them, and prosecute them. Abdul Muttalib came here. He was captured. Yes, he was Mirandized. And even after he was Mirandized, he gave out an enormous amount of information that was very, very helpful. We convicted him. What this is essentially saying is we don't trust the Department of Justice to do their job, so therefore we have to give the president the power to detain someone whether they have any evidence of a crime or not. If they come here, the Department of Justice does its job. We have tried and convicted over 400 terrorists in this country successfully. The only incentive to come here is if they're not going to commit a crime. All of the inmates down at Guantanamo were not captured in the U.S. No one who's been captured in the U.S. as a terrorist have we failed to convict. Let's trust the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't threaten us. The Constitution protects us. Let us use it and use it to bring these terrorists to justice as every single time we have successfully done.
There are more and more attempts to legitimize the use of internment camps to detain U.S. citizens in the event of unrest. We watch our leaders in Washington slowly pass bills that label ordinary Americans as thought criminals and potential domestic terrorists for simply questioning the actions of their government. We see third party candidates and their impassioned supporters listed in secret government reports that call their allegiance into question and brand them as fanatics and extremists. FBI and Homeland Security documents classify homeschoolers, gun rights activists, some veterans, and anti-abortionists as threats against the existing social and political order, by default creating an entire nation of radicals and revolutionaries where everyone is a suspect equally guilty until proven otherwise. And what is the solution to deal with these people? The same way as every other totalitarian regime throughout history, marginalize their activities, then lock them up. Prisons are being built, internment camps constructed, and laws passed that deal severely with anyone who dares to step out of line or ask too many questions. There are approximately over 600 prison camps in the U.S., all fully operational and ready to receive prisoners. They are all staffed and even surrounded by full-time guards, but they are all empty. These camps are to be operated by FEMA should martial law need to be implemented in the United States. The camps all have railroad facilities, as well as roads leading to and from the detention facilities. Many also have an airport nearby. The majority of the camps can house a population of 20,000 prisoners. Currently, the largest of these facilities is just outside Fairbanks, Alaska. The Alaskan facility is a massive mental health camp and can hold approximately two million people. One possible FEMA camp has been rumored for years to be at an Amtrak train repair center located in Beech Grove, Indiana. While stories and web videos have attempted to report suspicious activities, the conclusion when honestly investigated is that there really is not any internment camp there. Approximately 600 employees work there daily. We uncovered no unusual buildings, equipment, or personnel. Having said that, there are many well-documented camps and prisons that have sprung up around the United States the past decade or so. been a long time coming but tonight because of what we did on this day in this election at this defining moment change has come to america all right folks there's a lot going on right now decisions being made that are unprecedented and will have an overreaching impact on what it means to live in the united states of america both the senate and the house of representatives have just overwhelmingly passed the national defense authorization act Squeezed into this military funding bill are two provisions that give the military not just lots and lots of money, but lots and lots of power. I have two words for you, predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. You think I'm joking? Robert Whitaker. The tactical supervisor for El Paso SRT for Homeland Security Investigations. Well, we have our, our big vehicle out here. It's an armored vehicle. Uh, it's an AMRAP vehicle. It's mine resistant, ambush protected. That's what it stands for. That's what we use to deliver our our, um, our team to uh, high risk warrant services. The affirmative task we have now is uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Now to a controversial bill resurfacing in Congress. The FEMA camp bill allows the government to run at least six military installations when a national emergency is declared. These emergency centers would be run by FEMA under the command of the Secretary of Homeland Security. President Obama claimed the power to keep people in prison indefinitely with no charges against them, no conviction, no sentence, just imprisonment. Called agenda. 21. Agenda 21. 
Agenda 21. We've got to stabilize the population. When I was born, no, there were so too, what's wrong with the population? I mean, with too many people. Thank you, Laura. Um, Rick, what does population stabilization mean, and how do you seek to enforce that? On page 260, it shows the basic layout for a facility focusing on detainment. It is depicted with interrogation areas, tribunal areas, and mortuaries. Each detainment facility is designed to hold 4,000 prisoners, and they are depicted with multiple levels of barbed wire separating compartments within the facilities, with a double barbed wire fence enclosing them and watched over by 24 guard towers. Now, if there's any question whether these plans are active or just theoretical, this should be settled by the fact that the U.S. Army has been running ads for job positions in these camps since 2009, and apparently, they're still hiring. The FEMA plans to imprison American citizens have generated a lot of interest around the country in locating the potential prison camps throughout the country. The Rules Committee is going to meet in the House. They are going to come up with a rule that makes it okay for them to do a same-day bill. So they'll pass this rule. It's, believe it or not, called martial law. This last week, the U.S. Congress passed a bill uh, which repeals uh, passing comitatus, which means that they, we have now uh, institutionalized and codified uh, martial law. Mr. Speaker, I understand we're under martial law as declared by the Speaker last night. It is, it is surreal. Uh, you just never, you never expect to do this in your own country. Walking up and down these streets, you don't, you don't want to think about the stuff that you're going to have to do. Somebody pops around the corner. Let me shoot in America. Yeah. And of understanding is that the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution says that you must have probable cause to be able to do a, a, a search that does not violate an American's right against uh, unlawful searches and, search, uh, searches and seizures. Actually, you, you, the you, Fourth Amendment actually uh, protects all of us against unreasonable search and seizure. But, the, what, the, but the, says. the measure is probable cause, I believe. The amendment says unreasonable search and seizure. But does it not say prop for the no. the typical of what you see in an urban environment, people hanging out, doing nothing. And as we know, idle time is the devil's hands. Right? We've been saying people don't have jobs, they don't have a home to go to, or a home that they want to go to. So they just hang out all day long. They love it. Okay, this is US government property, no trespassing. Okay, up here they have the uh, barbed wire all the way around this. And they have guards that guards this. And they have hollow point bullets. Warning, moving gate can cause serious injury or death. That's scary. But uh, anyhow, there's lots of trailers all in a row. Now my question is, why do they need guards with hollow point bullets? That is my question. And I don't have the answers. Why the Bob wire? To house trailers. Land of the free. Home of the slave. Buckle up, folks, and drive carefully. I think we got a bumpy ride ahead.